Okay. So, um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, yesterday's audience started quite slow in the morning and then filled up as the afternoon went along, so I hope that'll happen today. Welcome to the second day of the Carnival Film Screenings in the program of events. I'm Leslie Loco, the curator of the 18th International Architecture Exhibition at La Biennale di Venezia, entitled The Laboratory of the Future. The aim of the Carnival Programme of Events is to provide an ongoing series of talks, roundtable discussions, performances, and so on, that extend the life of the exhibition beyond the exhibition, bringing the themes into the worlds of discourse, public conversation, and discussion. This is the seventh in our six-month program. All events are filmed and available online shortly after the live event. So if you weren't able to attend the events in person, please visit the Biennale YouTube channel to view the recordings. Today's program picks up on yesterday's screenings with a selection of short films from filmmakers, educators, and students. The screening, which lasts about an hour, is followed by two panel discussions with some of the most interesting and innovative filmmakers slash architects working today. It's not necessary to have seen all the films in the two-day carnival uh, screenings program, but I'm imagining that everybody here is interested in film and architecture and will enjoy the selection of feature length and short films that we've curated. There are seven filmmakers in today's session, uh, same as yesterday, and I'll be joined afterwards in the first panel by Noemi Blager, Luis Urbano, Ila Becker, Louise Lemoine, and I think by a pre-recorded um, statement from Amos Gitai. We'll have a short break between panels and then we'll welcome panelists Penelope Halarambidu, Mike Tight, Ewa Efiom, Liam Young, and Ainsley Alam Robson to the stage. But a short description of the amazing lineup of films the first two are by graduates Bitika Agrawal and Paris Gazola, students in postgraduate Unit 24 at the Bartlett School of Architecture, taught by Penelope and Mike. Mike jointly runs Unit 24 and is a practicing architect based in London, and Penelope is Professor of Architecture and Spatial Culture at the Bartlett School of Architecture, where she explores the relationship between architecture and film in her research and teaching. Introducing duration, and narrative through films creates a form of empathy with buildings and places, reveals their history, and unlocks the emotive power of design. Responding to real-world challenges through imaginative world-building and long-term thinking, their students' architectural films foreground the link between architecture, identity, and politics. Agrawal's film, Inhabiting Hybridity, is an architectural essay film on the syncretism of British and Indian cultures, commenting on the experience of being rooted in many places at once through the design of a transforming and transformative stone architectural sculpture. Gazola's My Land, Mine Land is an investigation into the, mine, the gold mining towns in the Western Australian desert, which excavates suppressed indigenous knowledge to reimagine desert living based on local resources remediation and coexistence. Robots of Brixton by the architect and filmmaker Kibwe Tavares is an architectural film project that explores the relationship between architecture, class, and race. Using the South London suburb of Brixton as a backdrop, the film uses robots as metaphors for future intake of migrants to the UK. It shows Brixton as a degenerated and forgotten area inhabited by the new robot workforce built and designed to carry out all the tasks which humans are no longer inclined to do. It follows the trials and tribulations of the young robots living at the sharp end of city life. When police invade the space the robots call their own, the tensions explode in an outbreak of violence that has its roots in real life. The film was the 2011 winner of the RIBA President's Medals in Architecture, which was a first for film. Liam Young is an architect, director, and BAFTA-nominated producer who is described by the BBC as the man designing our futures. His visionary films and speculative world designs for the entertainment industry are both extraordinary images of tomorrow and urgent examinations of the environmental questions facing us today. 
Planet City is a film set in an imaginary city for 10 billion people, where we surrender the rest of the world to a global-scaled wilderness and the return of stolen lands. The film follows a continuous festival procession dancing through the city on a 365-day loop. Each day, it intersects with a different carnival, culture, and celebration, endlessly cycling through new colors, costumes, and cacophonies. It is a collaborative work of multiple voices and cultures supported by an international team of acclaimed environmental scientists, theorists, and advisors. In his first film of the day, Planet City, we see that climate change is no longer a technological problem, but rather an ideological one, rooted in culture and politics. This is fiction shaped like a city. The great endeavor to capture all this carbon will involve the construction of the largest engineering project in human history and the development of a new infrastructure equivalent in size to that of the entire global fossil fuel industry. This is our generation's moon landing, a mobilization of workers and resources on a planetary scale that would only be possible through international cooperation to an extent never achieved. His film, The Great Endeavor, the second film, approaches this challenge with radical optimism, collaborating with a network of scientists and technologists to create a short film that captures the design, construction, visualization, and drama of what it might look like to build this infrastructural imaginary, transforming airborne carbon into liquefied gas to be pumped beneath the ocean floor or mineralized into the desert rock. Set to the score of a new planetary worker's song composed by vocalist Lyra Pramuk, the film celebrates technological sublime, chronicling the coordinated action to decolonize the atmosphere in the last great act of planetary transformation. Ainsley Allen Robson is an award-winning Ethiopian-American director, writer, and media artist whose counter-imaginings and emancipatory narratives speak to the liminal spaces between Africa and its diasporas. Juxtaposing both futuristic and analog media, Robson's work presents temporal manipulations that, radi that radiate fluidly, actively refusing linear definition. What does it mean for home to be constructed immaterially via fragments of culture and oral history distorted by the filter of time and migration? What does it mean to have a diasporic identity tied to nostalgia that is at times real and at times fabricated out of necessity? Ferenc is an experimental form of emancipatory thought, reclaiming her Ethiopian-American mixed-race identity and redefining boundaries between fragmented memories and the digital imaginary. Ewa Efyom is a London-based Belgian-Nigerian architect, writer, producer, and filmmaker. His films Eagle Mansions and Beck Road have screened at festivals internationally in Europe and Australasia. So I really hope you enjoy this, these short films. And uh, following this, we will have the first of our two panel discussions. So thank you for coming. OK. We start. Brilliant. So I hope you enjoyed the short films. Um, and I, I I have to say, I feel as if I'm in a slightly different universe and have to kind of come back down to earth. But I'm delighted to welcome our first panelists to the stage. And I'm going to start um, with a short introduction. Noemi Blager is, or Blager, Blager, better? Yeah. is an Argentine architect and curator based in London. With her curatorial work, she passionately champions visionary architecture that tackles today's climate and societal changes and challenges respecting local culture and emphasizing ethical and resource efficient solutions to do more with less. And her film was showed in yesterday's um, film screenings, A Lot With Little. So welcome, Noemi. <laughs> Luis Urbano is an architect, filmmaker, teacher, and researcher at the Porto School of Architecture in Portugal. He is the editor of Jack, Journal on Architecture and Cinema, author of the books Historia Simplis, circa 1963, and No Place is Deserted. And he's also the director of the short film Sisigia, which we showed in the carnival screenings yesterday. We also met, I think, in Cork, Ireland, probably about 10 years ago, so it's, it's a real pleasure to 
to welcome you back. Um, Ila Becker and Louise Lemoine are visual artists who work in a variety of media such as film, video installation, photography, and books. They experiment with new narrative and cinematic forms to explore how people experience, perceive, and relate to space from an emotional, societal, social, and cultural standpoint. And I should also say that um, we pirated one of your films about 10 years ago to show in Johannesburg, and I'm actually really thrilled that you're here, so <laughs> welcome. I'm gonna start um, with Luis and ask you, what do you think film has allowed you to say about space, society, and form that more conventional forms of architectural representation cannot? Well, first, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be with you again and here in Venice. Um, you know, I've been in, the, on, in the place where I come from, which is academia, I've been on an ongoing fight with my colleagues because I think um, the way that we, we, we think and we can reflect about architecture or represent architecture um, should not be restricted to the written language. Mm. And in the academia, most of the way people reflect on architecture is with uh, the written word, with thesis. And I think a thesis in the broader sense can be uh, much more powerful, powerfully uh, reflected if you use also other languages, mm -hmm. not just the specific language of architecture, which is drawings, and I don't understand why Architects cannot use drawing to make a reflection or, uh, or a photography or models that are more commonly used as architectural representation. But um, I think, for example, sounds, is, we have seen some of the films are incredibly rich in terms of soundscapes that we've seen today, for example, are very rich uh, in terms of soundscapes, but film, I think film allows us to bring uh, a lot of uh, char spatial characteristics that are not very common on the other one, or, or, or the other forms of representation can't, uh, can't uh, use. For example, movement through space, or uh, the way the light changes, or the narrative qualities of space. And, um, you know, at the beginning, I've been dealing with this issue about, for about 20 years now, researching or filming or teaching. And um, the beginning, I, I started with my students using fiction films to depict architecture. And, and um, I think fiction can um, bring to, to, to architectural representation, um, for example, characters or a use of um, space that, that people don't see on the other forms of representation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the meaning that you can use with fiction and narrative, it's very powerful to represent architecture. Mm. It's, um, we'll come back to this point a little bit later, but it struck me in, in watching all of the short films that there's a real distinction between films that are about architecture and films that are in themselves architectural. And I, I want to explore that boundary a little bit more um, as, as we talk. But Noemi, in your description of, of your film, you made the point that film is a sustainable way to present architecture without the need for transportation or waste, making an exhibition fully accessible worldwide. What implications might this have for the way architecture is disseminated and experienced if the major way that we see it is through film? Well, um, that's just one aspect, um, one of the practicalities, if you want, a practical, the practical side of, of um, showing architecture through films. But I think that for me, the main reason why I chose film is because, to me, architecture starts making sense when it's inhabited. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, 
I have been to places that I've had seen before, architecture, and nothing, nothing compares to the real experience. And I always felt that um, film is a way to bring um, an audience closer, as close as possible to the experience of architecture itself. Um, and in terms of what it means uh, in spreading or in communic communicating architecture, um, I think it's very important. When I was uh, considering how to uh, better communicate architecture, when I did an exhibition about Lina Bobardi, for instance, I felt that um, I wanted to communicate in a way that um, it will not only talk to architects, which you can do with uh, our usual means, the traditional ways of showing architecture, through drawings and models and photography, of course, but um, get a more emotional kind of uh, connection with the architecture. And if you show architecture and connect it to its culture, the, the, the context, I think it says a lot more about the architecture than showing it as an isolated example. I mean, the, the, the question of emotion, I think, is, is really important. It's been a very important component in the exhibition as a whole. I think there's been an incredible amount of emotion poured into all of the exhibits. And searching for the right medium that can both convey the emotion of the, the participant or the practitioner making it, but also the emotion of the audience, I think has been a thread that's been running throughout all of this. So I, I wanna hold on to that, that idea about emotion. And Ilan and Louise, you've attained an enormous following in architectural circles for the blend of documentary and narrative in your work, but also because architecture, whether a building, a client, an occupant, or a historical event, is also treated and experienced as a character in its own right. Knowing what you already know about architecture and film, is there anything that film cannot do? And by that I mean in terms of pushing our understanding of architecture further. Hello everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation. We are uh, very happy to be, to be part of this panel. And um, I think just before answering this question of where cinema ends or the possibi limited possibility of cinema, I wanted to uh, say a few words about what you just said now about uh, uh, the search or the look for emotions through e exhibition space. I think it really relates to what we've been just uh, starting to say about the, the mean of cinema, the, mm -hmm. the, the potential of the medium of cinema in uh, bringing, uh, let's say, a closer sense of the experience of space. I think th that's, uh, I was amazed now how much uh, video is present in, in, in this exhibition, for instance, and how much also, because you've been facing as a curator the, the, the challenge and the question of how, what do we show of architecture? How can we translate architecture and, and, uh, and what do we bring it, what do we bring from it in the sense that architecture be not mobile or uh, um, and unreachable? And so it's really interesting, this question of what degree or uh, how deep can we translate that experience which will be necessarily absent. And so probably until now, the form of cinema is the one, or probably the VR is even beyond, but the form of cinema is the one that uh, brings out the deepest sense of being there, in the sense that being a, a multisensorial uh, tool and medium, it brings uh, the, mm, the closest uh, yeah, mm, sensorial experience of it uh, being visually, the sound, it, you, you can get the atmosphere through the mm. image. Uh, and, uh, but it's interesting in the exhibition how much even uh, beyond this uh, only use of, uh, of the moving images also 
installation, sound installation, all uh, of the, or most of the exhibitors have been looking to, um, to give uh, more than information. How, how you convey the interest, how you attract the attention of the spectator through something else than just data or information. How do you um, uh, make a sense of place in your few meters square that you, you have as mm. an exhibitor? No, it's a very interesting how um, there is a, a deep interest now in creating something immersive, something which is um, more sensorial, more physical mm -hmm. in terms of the way we, we trans, uh, transcript or translate the experience of mm -hmm. space. Then probably, of course, uh, cinema is a two-dimensional medium. Um, and it's also a, a, a language which uses a chronological order, which imposes a start, a, a development, and an end. So there is a certain um, strict aspect of it, of, the, of a narration. You, you know well what narration means and how writing can be also a, a, a form which doesn't evolve anymore when you have finished your, uh, a film. We, we've been uh, very interested in uh, building up filmic forms which mm, try to explode or which try to, to um, fragment very much the timeline. But uh, still, in a screening, in a, in a theater, you will be defined by the chronology of the film or the film file is finished and closed. So, um, yeah, that's a limit. Mm. I mean, it's interesting, there's a kind of tension. I, I felt it even in watching these films where, on the one hand, you want to be completely freed of all expectations because it feels as if the filmmakers are using film to say something that has not yet been said, to, to really explore the possibilities of film as a language, to, to give voice to something that's maybe been silenced or overlooked or not articulated. But at the same time, we have conventions to watching film, and maybe those are the kind of chronological conventions. There's the beginning, there's the credits that go up, there's the relationship of sound to the image. There's a way that we try to understand it in a more normative sense, but the the films themselves seem to want to pull us away from that, and then there's a curious tension there. But yeah, Ila, you were going to say something. What can film not I, to do? <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, no, I, I, I was thinking that about the representation of architecture, that uh, <clears throat> I'm an architect, but uh, uh, an architect who has never built anything, so I never built a, a building, even, a, a, I don't know, a parking for our cars, but, uh, so from the beginning, we, we with Luis, uh, who is not an architect, we were not really interested in how to represent architecture. Mm -hmm. It's not really my, my problem. Uh, I was thinking, I think, uh, many other things. And one of other things was uh, more than uh, using the film to represent the, archite the architecture of uh, an architect, is uh, how to represent the space. And uh, from the beginning, it was really a big question for us because representing a space uh, for us was <clears throat> in the meaning, it was the meaning was uh, to represent how we deal with the space ourselves. So what uh, during when I studied architecture, well, I was always thinking about this. And when we started to talk about this, we said, uh, oh, this is really complicated to do with uh, a medium. That is, uh, which one is, is the best? I was, I was making film at that moment, but uh, we said, uh, maybe there's no one that is the perfect one, but we can try to do it in several uh, ways, or we start also writing, so that's why, because we, why we use uh, everything to, to try to, at the beginning was the representation of space, and after that we, we thought that uh, maybe more than representing a space was uh, interesting to share an experience of the space. Mm -hmm. Not only our experience, but, uh, uh, but also the experience that we have in, uh, with other people experiencing a space. And experiencing a space uh, is something co very complicated to, to share. So, but you can uh, but you can talk about it. You can uh, you can uh, show it also in your how your body is moving. I say uh, 
the, the movement is very important. So there are many things that can uh, help you to share this, uh, this experience. And so we started to make films for, for, thi for this, but uh, everything we, we made, uh, we make uh, is always, uh, uh <coughs> there's always some photograph or, 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 or we, we write text or we wrote books, uh, because it's a kind of uh, struggle to try to, to, to put on, on a medium of representation something that you, you feel. Mm -hmm. And uh, obviously uh, in all the, <coughs> Uh, all the, the, the you know the history of architecture. The only way to feel something is to to be there, no? So if you uh, if you want to really know how is it uh, in architecture or a space that inside an architecture, you have to go there because everything is changing since uh, related to your senses. So it's, it's very complicated. But in a way, we can we can try. So we can also try to to share something that we have in mind. So I've seen many films try also to to put on images uh, the, the, the thought that you have or an Im imaginary world. But uh, what for us is, is always interesting is uh, understanding how we deal with the space, how the space, and what is the power of the space emotionally. That's why also we, we wrote a book about this, the emotion of the space, uh, how the power of the emotion, of the, uh, the emotional power of the space, how the space is so powerful to change our behavior, mm -hmm. and not only our behavior, to create also emotion. And this is uh, coming back to my architectural studies, something that we, well, it's, not, it's very rare to talk about this in the, in the School of Architecture, that uh, understanding that the tool that you have in, my, in, in your hands is a, an incredible powerful tool to create some space that can change the behavior of the people in a little scale, but also if you multiply this little scale in a very large scale, very, very large scale. So we can use this tool like mm. this. But it's, it's... This is for our kids who is going out of school. Don't worry. We have to go to... <laughs> but, we, but don't worry, we have a today the babysitting. <laughs> but the, the one thing that is really... Um, I don't know quite what the word is, is that on the one hand, we're always taught that architecture is about space. You know, that seems to be the primary vocabulary. And I remember my first teaching gig in the United States, and it was the first time I'd ever heard of something called, um, it's one of those, I think it's a survey class where you have 3,000 slides of important buildings around the world and you sit in a dark room somewhere in Iowa and you show the slides and you explain the buildings. And I remember looking out at the students and thinking the chances of any one of those students ever going to see the Parthenon is remote. So the image of architecture that we're showing them, they will never physically experience. And increasingly, people experience what we call architecture through a whole range of other media, through screens, through cinema, through WhatsApp, through, in other words, the experience of not being there. So it seems to me that, that film now takes on another kind of dimension because it's not an approximation of something out there, it is its own thing. And that aspect of the relationship between film and architecture I think is what everybody certainly in this panel and the one that's following is trying to grapple with. It's not about the relationship between architecture or film. It's what is the new medium that is both of those things maybe simultaneously. And this I'm kind of interested to know what, what you think about. Is, is this a new direction for film? You're gonna say what direction? <laughs> First, uh, let me just add something, because of what Louise was saying, the, the, um, the experience of seeing a film in a dark room like this one, it's quite physical, you know? It's, mm -hmm. it's like, a, brings the aptic qualities of space because we, we can experience physically what we are seeing with the combination of sound and light and our own memory of spaces, so it's a quite physical experience that we don't have in other forms of architectural rep representation. And also I think that the way people remember their own e architectural experience, it's not a continuous move through space. So I think our own memory of space uses 
something similar to film language, mm -hmm. because we, we remember spaces uh, uh, with cuts and with the sequences, and so it's, th there's a, a quite proximity about the experience of space and the experience of seeing a film. And, um, but I, I'm an architect, of course, and I made architecture for a while, for 15 years, and I don't think that film is a substitute to the experience of space. So when we, when we are doing a film about architecture or on architecture, uh, we don't intend to substitute the experience of space. So I think we are creating, and one of the most fascinating things about film it, is that it can be incoherent mm -hmm. in terms of architecture. Of course, if you are doing, um, if you have a, uh, if someone asks you, an architect, for example, asks you to, to represent their own building, it will be a little bit tricky to uh, change the, or the, the, the order of the space. Or, but I think it's one of the most uh, fascinating things in, in film, for example, in, in fictional film, that the interiors never, all, almost never um, correspond to the exterior of the film. So this incoherence of uh, arch film architecture is quite, it's something that I've been finding very fascinating. Mm. I mean, just to pick up on that word incoherence, it's, it's such a beautiful word because it implies a, a lack of coherence, but actually it's a very potent word because that's the way we experience space incoherently. You know, if, if I think about the conventional representation of architecture, certainly the, the representation that I was taught, the plan, the section, the elevation were all about making the making space coherent, this follows that. But that's never the way we experience it. So there's a kind of creative freedom, I think, in 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 in, in um, embracing this idea of incoherence. Well, I think I think that um, there's a, a kind of separation. Uh, while designing, while doing the drawings, while doing the floor plans, while doing, there's a control and there's an intention and the architect controls <laughs> in that, during that time, controls what he or she would want to happen mm -hmm. there or imagining. But the moment um, the architect is gone, uh, what happens in the building is decided by who inhabits it. And, and I think that, um, and that is when something can become beautiful or not. And I think that the aspect of beauty and not in, the, in beauty in the canonical sense, but uh, more in the sense of a more poetic thing uh, is something that film can also communicate because uh, when you bring, you know, sound and um, you can communicate an, an atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And um, in, in the case of the work I do, which is curating, I think that I try to show, to communicate a message through film because I think that it, um, rather than explaining something in a more rational way, as we have been saying, it's a more emotional way and, and can, can give a sense of beauty in the experience and not mm. in the decision or the, the design per se. Of course, it is important, but I think that uh, that's a different kind of coherence, if you will. Mm. But there's, there's one quote in the exhibition, um, and people have asked me about it a couple of times, and it's, it's one of those phrases that I've heard for so long, I no longer remember who said it. So it's written on one of the walls, and it's not attributed to anyone. And it's that you can offer without giving, and the act of offering is also a form of power. And I think there's something very um, generous about film, that it offers something to you in a way that architectural representation doesn't usually. Architecture itself, the built object, often makes that same kind of offering. You can do this in a space, or you can feel in this way, but you don't have to. But there's something very, very powerful about film 
that takes this aspect of maybe it's incoherence and a kind of open-ended generosity that the control of architectural representation doesn't normally do. So I guess for me the, the question is, well, if we were to adopt film as a, as a bona fide medium for architectural expression, what would happen? What would happen to architecture? Mm, it's interesting because I think tonight you have gathered people with very different practices and very different understanding of what films I film mm -hmm. is in its narrative uh, dimension, but also in, in how we relate to the question of space and architecture. Mm -hmm. So it's extremely interesting that the same question could be answered very differently <laughs> by the various uh, participants. Um, maybe if I can just also uh, say a few things related to this notion of, uh, of e incoherence. I like it very much because uh, um, uh, we, um, in our practice, we, we have left apart completely the idea that film would be a, a descriptive tool in the sense, in a sort of um, pragmatic uh, dimension and, and, and a tool for architects to just to, um, to depict space in a rather rational way. We were very much interested to uh, explore the potential uh, of, of the medium of cinema to get closer to how uh, spatial memory works, mm -hmm. and, and uh, which is very incoherent. And, and as you mentioned before, our experience of space, um, memory works as a filter, right? We, we will remember of an experience, uh, a series of punctum, a series of moments which left more impressions on us because it relates to things we are more connected to, etc. So when, when you go through a building, being small or big, in a city as well, you will, you will necessarily, after a while, decompose your experience in a series of moments, in a series of points, of angles, of elements, and so you deconstruct the space completely. And so what we try to do, to do uh, methodolo methodologically in, in the editing process we make our films is to, to, um, to very much um, mold our uh, editing process on that mm -hmm. memory, a selection of mm -hmm. selective memory, let's say, in order to um, focus more on, on, uh, on these intensities uh, space can produce emotionally um, when we experience it. And so definitely uh, when you get a little bit far from the necessity of describing space in a sort of uh, anonymous tool, uh, you, can, uh, you can play very much with a sort of um, Yes, this distance of interpretation and how close or far you get from this idea of, of depiction. Mm -hmm. But I think you can get the sense of a place even through very suggestive, very distant <laughs> approach rather than be very clinical ones. Mm. There's a, yeah, I was thinking about this, you know that we are very interested in how works the spatial memory, for example. And the special memory in the brain is located in a part of really inside the brain that is called hippocampus. And this is really the, the place where we stock all the information. All those, uh, you, we, ha we have some neurons that are called uh, GPS neurons because uh, we use these kind of neurons also for remind yourself how the space is, is, uh, is, um, is to, 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 to navigate. So you, if you can go back home, it, it's thanks to this, and this is in, in the hippocampus. And there's a very interesting experiment that some neuro neurobiologists did uh, in, uh, in London with, uh, that is called a taxi driver um, mm -hmm. uh, exper experience, experiment. And uh, they study all the, the driver, taxi drivers in London for a very long time. Because if you, I don't know if all the to today, but uh, if you want to be a taxi driver in, in London, you have to, to, to memorize all the streets of the city because you have to know immediately where to go. So it's very complicated to be a taxi driver. 
at least it was at that time. And because you have to memorize everything, everything, and use it all the time. So you say an, an address, and your hippocampus is working a lot, a lot. And so they, they did this exper exper experiment, so making a RMI at the beginning, and uh, an, another RMI is the kind of uh, exam so that you can do it in the brain to watch the, the, the volume of your brain. And so at the end, they discovered the hippocampus was larger than the, the beginning. And they discovered also that uh, the, the more larger hippocampus they, all, they ever uh, found, it was this for the taxi driver. This is for us was very interesting reading at this experience because we said, wow, we can improve our hippocampus and our ability to, f to, to, to relate ourselves to space. So how can we, can we do it? And, uh, and we, we said, ah, maybe, maybe just to be aware of, of the fact that every moment you are related to a space and you think about uh, as a, a taxi driver, <laughs> you're thinking all the time to the space, it can, uh, it can develop your hippocampus. So film, making film or talking about the space could, 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 be, could do, do this also. For us it was very interesting because we say, wow, it could be fantastic if someone uh, looking at watching our film at the end of the film has a little bit more of hippo hippocampus, no? <laughs> I certainly felt like that <laughs> this hour <laughs> after watching them. Um, so some film also do, do the, the opposite, huh? your, your hippocampus. <laughs> but do you, maybe this is a final question, I'm going to um, open it to the audience in a minute, but are you optimistic about the pairing of architecture and film? I am. I think that um, for starters, you, the fact that you can communicate in a very uh, sensorial way uh, the experience of architecture in one corner of the world, taking it to a completely different corner of the world, allows for um, different interpretations of the same thing. So. Um, to extrapolate ideas in a way that with other forms of representation, it is also possible, but I feel it's richer because it's not only for architects, I think that it can communicate to a general public and a um, sensible public and, and, and because I think that like with novels or like with everything, it's the, the reader always completes the story. Mm. I think that film allows for that level of abstraction and um, to bring more fantasy for the, the audience, mm -hmm. to, mm. to be more creative interpreters in a way, I personally think. Luis is going to say, "Yeah, I, I'm totally positive. I think I've been, we've been uh, uh, working in that field for a, a long time now, and we we could really see a growing interest, an, an amount of festivals of uh, events that are related to films and architecture in in such a way. I think it's really a, a growing field, mm -hmm. and uh, and also what I'm super interested by to see how many um, branches this uh, new medium is taking. I mean, we have seen tonight uh, um, also a certain use of it, but uh, there are an infinite number. Mm -hmm. uh, even in in teaching practice, we, we understand how the students are extremely receptive and interested to explore more also subjective forms of expression in which mm -hmm. they also engage personally, uh, autobiographically also. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and this is very, very interesting in, uh, in a school of architecture, how you also could uh, find forms in which you exist uh, as, a, as a person, in which you express yourself. We, we've seen many use of uh, voiceover, even the, the first two by students. Um, and uh, it's, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm 
we are constantly amazed by all the forms and evolving forms it takes right now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah th that's uh, very interesting how to use um, and uh, the tool of film for a student in architecture because uh, because the, I, I think and the, the big problem is talking always about film and architecture or architectural film. That's a problem because uh, all the time when you talk with uh, some architects or ev everyone, uh, they, they everybody always think that uh, uh, the, f the film is something, is a tool to represent the architecture. This is uh, for us a very big problem because uh, from the beginning we never did this. So we never use uh, the film to represent uh, an architecture, but was uh, made uh, the use of film for for something else, but in in the, in, the, in the school we can understand much better this because the the student when they come, for example, when we we teach uh, in some in, in university, they the, the student they arrive, they they really think that uh, they are going to 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 know how to film very well a building, so I can make a film. Uh, I can one day I can use my camera to to represent my building. That so it's a fantastic tool to represent. The, the, the architecture, but uh, after after that, when we we spend a, a little a little time with them, with them, they, they then immediately they they can be aware to something else that uh, they can use the film not to represent something, right, but to talk themselves about something, and talking about the 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 the, 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 re the relational space is is in incredibly rich because uh, if you if we we well, uh, every time we see the film at the end when the, the films you know, at the end of the courses, it's it's incredible. They are so personal and they they can they can talk about uh, what they feel in the, in in the space. How they feel about uh, the space in general about. Uh, 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 asking to the other, so it's it's a very interesting tool, as m many others, but not to represent architecture, to 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 be aware about your your relationship mm -hmm. to space. I'm 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 really I'm see insisting about this because uh, all the time we are because we we make films and we are very often in the field of architecture, but. Uh, when we go outside and we present our film uh, in, uh, for example, a documentary or, or art contemporary, other other f different films, no one cares about the architecture, so it's, uh, we don't talk about this. And, but uh, we, when we are around uh, these people of architecture, we always uh, struggle to say, but no, we, no, we, we <laughs> so because uh, they ask what what you can do for us, we mm -hmm. can not, we can nothing, we, we don't do no anything for you, it's not for you as a as architects. We we can that's something much more interest interesting things to to explore with film, much more than representing uh, the architecture. Exactly. It's okay, why not? There's uh, people that uh, there's many very good photographers, they represent the architecture perfectly. But uh, why, why from the beginning we say, why only this? We, mm -hmm. we can do much more. Ab absolutely. Lucy, you yeah. I think I think film uh, allows a, a more broader audience to relate with architecture because the specific language of architecture is just for architects. Most of the people don't understand architectural drawings or even models. They find it funny, but they don't really uh, understand how they would experience space in that miniature. So I think the, the, the capacity of film to, uh, so that people can experience space in film, I think uh, it's to, much, to a much bigger audience than just the, the architectural field. But what I think it's also uh, interesting is that um, this idea of uh, either using fiction or documentary, it's kind of a, a, a tricky field because I think if you are a control freak like I am, fiction is, is a much more um, powerful way to control everything in, in the when you're making a film. The Manuel de Oliveira, is a, it was a Portuguese filmmaker. He won a golden lion here in, in Venice. And he said, I do fiction film because doing documentary is much more difficult. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and I think it has to do with this, um, this, this will to control everything when you're making a film or a fiction film and you can decide what the people will say, what the, the character will do, the interaction with the space, etc. Of course, what fiction doesn't give you, it's this, and I think we can see that in, in Louise and, and Ila film, is that uh, 
in fiction you cannot be surprised with the wonderful complexities of reality. And I think sometimes in a documentary you, you, you are surprised what, what, what is happening and in, in a sense in a fiction film the film is decided before you started to film and in a documentary you decide the film after mm -hmm. you started to film. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's one aspect, and I think this will lead into the, the second panel discussion really well, which is that when I started teaching in South Africa, particularly for young African architects who couldn't find in the canon an easy way to express something that didn't yet have form, film was this amazing tool of liberation because suddenly you could suspend the structure of canon, the structure of control, to allow something to emerge that, that wasn't fully formed. It, it meant, of course, that there was a, an aspect of technology that had to be mastered in order to make it coherent. But I came away from those five years understanding the relationship to film and architecture completely differently it seemed to me as if film was giving birth to a new form of spatial expression. I think it's still very much part of that. And so in a way, these many different iterations of filmmakers and the way you all come to the subject of architecture, for me, is, is actually part of forming a new canon. And that aspect of it is, is still super exciting. That It feels as if there's something still to be born. Mm. Yeah, but I, I've been, you know, finding that architecture students and architects, I should say, are particularly keen at using film language because the way we think about architecture and the way an architecture students think about architecture is exactly what you were saying, because we, we are thinking about something that doesn't exist Just yet. Mm. So we are used to have this abstract uh, thinking about something that doesn't exist. And, uh, and, and, and in designing a reality that it's quite complex in terms of how it's going to be built, but also how it's going to be experienced. For example, the relationship between a bigger space like this uh, theater and the small corridor that we go to the outside, it's quite a complex reality. And, uh, and because s architecture students are used to think on, on this way, they find the film language quite, uh, I, don't, I wouldn't say easy, but uh, I think it's, it's a useful way of experience because they are used to this kind of thought. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's also a, a medium that, and it's a, it's a crude analogy, but it seems to be a medium that's really pregnant with possibility all the time. And that aspect of something that's there, that's below the surface, it's, it's emerging, it's embryonic, it's not yet in the world, I think is a really powerful it's a powerful state to be in, and, and for some reason, film seems to act that way. It, it supports that way of thinking. I think there's another aspect that interests me a lot, which is um, the prejudice that there is about how you perceive certain types of architecture and associating things with certain cultures. And I think that film, what film, also allows is to break those prejudices, dissolve them, show, show different experiences that were not in the imagery of, mm -hmm. of the audience, mm -hmm. basically. And I think that in this way, in, in a way that people can relate to, and I think that that's a very interesting aspect of film as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to, I mean, I know we've got a very, very small audience, but is there any questions, particularly from our Panelists are going to come up the second time around. Is there anything that you want to ask? Yeah, kind of me. Yes. Wait, wait. Uh, hi. Yeah, it, it's a very interesting uh, discussion, and uh, a lot of uh, thoughts are triggered, but. Um, um, something that uh, came across my mind, and I, I, we were not here to watch the screening yesterday, uh, so I haven't seen all the films, but uh, I have seen uh, 
the Butoh House film last year at the Rotterdam Biennale. We were actually there with our students and we watched it uh, there. And um, uh, because I think that there is a, also a distinction between different types of filming of what we're discussing today in terms of camera work, uh, moving with a camera within an existing environment and world building in the kind of digital filming that uh, happens within the students, but in in the filming that uh, you do, there is always this element of uh, prediction, but also accident. And I wanted uh, about the role of accident in your work, because I think having seen quite a lot of your films, I'm a huge fan. Um, accident plays a huge role in what you do, and the way that you capture accident but it's a kind of spatial accident as well. It's as if you're waiting for these spatial accidents to happen. And it seemed to me that that film was actually altogether an accident. So I wondered if you had something to say about, but maybe others to, to perhaps reflect on this idea of prediction, planning of a film, mm -hmm. and the role of accident in that negotiation between a camera and the space that it records. Yeah, uh, thank you for your, your question, uh, I think. Uh, the, for, for us, the accident is absolutely very important. This film is a very big accident <laughs> from the beginning. We were not supposed to make this film. It, it happened like this. But uh, it, it always happened like this for us. So we are, because uh, uh, as you said, uh, when you make fiction, it's, uh, it's what you have in mind, your idea of the world that you want to put it in. Uh, in a, in a, in a the given a shape, you put it in a film and explain it to the other what is your what you have in mind. It's a kind of uh, sometimes could be a kind of uh, egoist, selfish uh, idea of the of the world. So you explain to the other what you what you have thought. In uh, in for us, it was from the beginning. It wasn't it wasn't that we wanted just to open our mind as more as possible and observe the world. We want to observe, so we want to. To, to, to be ready to what is happening to all around us. So it happens very, very often that we want to make something, that, that we have a very, uh, an idea of making something. And uh, at that moment, something uh, very interesting is happening. And we observe in them and say, wow, uh, this is much more interesting of what we wanted to do. And maybe we talk with someone that is saying something extremely interesting and the whole thing will be just what he's saying. This is because uh, we are always in a position of uh, observation, and it's a kind of uh, we, we try to be the much more yeah, uh, generous uh, in, in, in relation to this uh, this observation. So when uh, someone is uh, say of doing something, we uh, we try to to understand uh, what is the the, the the special interest in what is doing. And we we have a series of films that we we are still making. And now we are we made eleven films uh, and uh, about the city and the people, how the people live and, and relate to the space, to, to the urban space or the urban environment. And this is uh, much more about this, about the uh, accident, because we we are just like a uh, sponge, no? Like uh, we are, we put out our body in a, in a, in a place and we just respond to what is happening. Uh, and uh, and is what is incredible is there's always something happening no it's always something happening is but uh, you need you need maybe your uh, disposition you need time you need uh, the the if you want to 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 observe this that uh, there's always always something magic happening and in 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 that film it's uh, it's incredible because it's incredible because we we were there for for the Kenzo Tange building, and we, we discovered it just in front of this building. It was another <laughs> masterpiece, incredible masterpiece. And what is uh, for us very important in this film, that is uh, it's about the relationship that the man has uh, with the space, with the very intimate space of his own house. And he's, he's creating his house himself to, uh, that is, uh, it's a, it's a kind of apotheosis of the relation between uh, the body and the space. And what was very, very po incredible poetical about this guy that is building his house alone is that at the end, if, I don't know if you remember the end of the film, is when we ask him, 
And, and that's for me a very important uh, architectural uh, topic. When we ask him if we could talk about the project, about his house, his answer was just to starting a dance. Uh, he danced for, during three minutes and said, this is my project. Mm -hmm. So imagine, imagine to, to teach this in a school of architecture. So we are very happy to, uh, every time we, we, we teach in the school, we show this film because we say, can you imagine to create a project just with uh, in, in mind having a, in mind a dance? Mm -hmm. That's a very powerful because dance dance is the much is there is there's nothing more powerful that uh, the the relation to the space your body in the space that uh, during a, a dance there's no it's, it's fantastic no because you a dancing is relating your your body with the space. Such an interesting point. I mean, um, I don't know if you know the films of Adam Curtis, the, the documentary maker, and he does these huge, really um, complex films about politics, ecology. I mean, they're, they're, they're amazing masterpieces. But one thing that's common in all of his films is that he films people dancing, that somehow the mega narratives of artificial intelligence, political interference, the war on terror, all of these mega themes, some way for him to make sense of the, the complexity is, is to film dancers. And it seems like such an odd juxtaposition, but there is something in that relationship. And I noticed it in some of the films today, that in, in, especially in Liam's film, you know, this, the idea of a mythical creature involved in some form of dance as a way to encapsulate hope, but also fear and possibility, I think is, is, is super interesting, yeah. So we've got maybe one more question on this side, one more response. No, I, I was just thinking ab about these possibi two possibilities of film is that, as we have seen in some films today, is that the, we can see some radical designs on film that don't yet exist but it opens some doors for people to get used to the, some ideas that mm -hmm. if, we, we, if we say 20 years ago that we are going to have a computer and the screen 24 hours near our bodies, people wouldn't believe so. All of our, um, unfortunately, most of these visions of the future are uh, dystopias, you know, but all the fears that we have about hyper-urban uh, density like we have seen in Liam's film or climate change or pandemics or this idea of aerial mobility, uh, artificial intelligence, all of those were already depicted in film in relation with space. Mm -hmm. For example, in Minor Minority Report, and now it's becoming a reality. And this combination mm -hmm. between virtual reality and physical um, realm that we are going to experience in the near future because uh, no nowadays the, the glasses that mm. th these tech companies are inventing are not yet very good but when they are good enough and light enough for us to use we're going to live in this immersive combination between virtual and reality so maybe we can be you know walking around Venice and these glasses will erase all of these uh, actually, like I, I, I was today. And 90% of the tourists I see walking around Venice were already doing that. Yeah, they probably. see Venice through the, through the iPhone. Yeah. yeah, it looks like there's a question down there, yeah. Yes, uh, I was really interested about uh, your theory about the taxi driver. And uh, I, I'd like to ask if um, these movies can be defined also as uh, road movies because, I mean, cities are made of roads, and uh, so mm, can you tell me if mm, you can, in a kind of way, define these movies as road movies also? It's for me, huh? Well, <laughs> but uh, yeah. I, I would say that, it's, it's, uh, unfortunately, it's not my theory that uh, the taxi driver is a, it's a very famous uh, in neurology, a very famous uh, experiment. But uh, I haven't seen uh, before the relationship between the taxi driver and, and uh, the road movie, but it's, it's, uh, it's in a way is interesting. But uh, it's so that we also make films like a, a road movie. Eh? Everything we make is a kind of road movie because we, 
and we also have some really road, road movie. We did uh, two for until now, but we are going to film another one in, in, in a week in Mumbai. And uh, it's, uh, it's very interesting, the road movie, because this road movie, there's a, it's, a, it's a structure in film that can uh, allow a lot of accidents. So uh, not only on the street, but on the car, but uh, we hope not. But, uh, <laughs> but many, many film, cinematographical accidents. Oops. And drift, uh, and uh, for, uh, for instance, we, we made a film in Tokyo with uh, Ryu and Ishizawa that is uh, really a, a road movie because we spent one day f with them from uh, morning to, uh, to the evening and uh, going around with them uh, in Tokyo. And uh, at the beginning of the, fi of the film, it was during the uh, springtime and it was just before that day was so beautiful weather and that day the, the day started with a very heavy rain it was raining so very very hard and this changed completely the film and the film was a, a road a, a wet road movie mm -hmm. completely wet so much more for was behind in the car because it was a very old car and and everything changed completely totally and uh, the road movie is fantastic uh, maybe i think that the structure of this because you you have to change the, the street because something that uh, some uh, may not work in that place. So there's many many accidents. So uh, I don't know where I speak and uh, talking <laughs> about this, but uh no, but may maybe uh, just to add uh, to to this and to relate to the idea of accidents. I think why we we like the form of it and. Uh, but also the idea of a road movie is that probably you know where you start, but you don't know where you will end. And so the idea is that you, we make films this way. The idea is that to put ingredients on the table and make a film out of it, but we don't script anything. So we knew that we were starting the day at 8 p.m. on a very specific space, but then the film you, you, is You can know where it ends, but you don't know what is happening in between. Yeah. So the, the idea is that the film itself is an experience not only for the spectator, but on also for us and primarily for us as, as filmmakers. And the an idea is that the, the film, we understand it as a, a shared space in the sense that as directors, we only do 50% of it, but the other 50% will be made by who is making it with us in the sense that uh, the let's say the characters or the people we involve in and and also the place the the, the cityscape all what happens and all the accidents will which will uh, happen I mean just add a little bit we don't want to monopolize the, 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 this but uh, it's something also very interesting in the accident and also in the in the road movie that uh, in the accident during the accident uh, people struggle with their own representation so you can have much more uh, spontaneity. spontaneity during an accident because uh, the accident is stronger than what you want to represent yourself. So if you film someone that is everything is ready, the light is fantastic. We we can even uh, try several times to do it. You can you will represent yourself and you will be fantastic at uh, on the, on the image and talking very perfectly. So you will be the, the very intelligent man, and uh, that you say uh, and, and beautiful. If there's an accident, you cannot do this. So you are immediately uh, confronted to. What your real nature, no? So you have to, you have to. We we can we can say we can see the the real personality of people during the accident. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. <laughs> can I just? One, you answer and then the other. Yeah. Please. Okay. No, I was not answering. I was just I was thinking about something completely opposite of what I think all most of us do because we work with very low budgets. And, uh, but there is another field that architects also can participate in film, which is set design. Mm -hmm. And this, uh, this ability that architects also have to uh, work in film, when in big productions, for example, uh, because the, the, the skills to work in, in the film industry is quite similar to the ones that we have as architects, for example, this, this uh, capacity of creating atmospheres or construction techniques or the textures of materials or the way the light uh, shapes spaces. It's a completely lie because most of the set architecture is a lie, but I've been incredibly fascinated by this 
For example, I don't, I don't know if you know uh, Alexandra Tronner, that was a very famous set designer that worked with Billy, Billy Wilder in some of the films in the 60s and 70s, and it built these huge set designs, for example, uh, in a film called Irma Ladus with, uh, with uh, Shirley MacLaine and Jack Lemmon. Mm -hmm. She's a prostitute, she is a, police, a policeman, and uh, they built this huge set uh, that represent uh, Paris, and it was more Parisian than okay. Paris itself, yeah. 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 We, using these you know, uh, perspective techniques and completely fake architecture, but in the film, it looks very much more real than the real thing. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's so interesting, I mean, um, well, no, I'm gonna, Liam, you go ahead. Um, uh, I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about this in our uh, next panel as well, but I wanted to ask uh, to the group on the stage right now, but bec because all of you make films, but you also teach architects to make films, and what that often might mean is that you're teaching someone to make a film who's never made a film before and may never make a film again. So I wonder what you think they're getting out of this work, what you hope that they're getting out of that work that they might do in your respective studios. Like, do you think that they would, do you hope that they would go on and become filmmakers? Or that when they go on and become architects, somehow they're different or better architects because they've made a film? Do you get depressed when they end up in Hawkins Brown working on buildings instead of applying for the Sundance Lab? Like, where do you think teaching film as a practice in architecture school lands people. Mm. Well, actually, oh, sorry. No, no. Actually, some of my students became filmmakers, so not that bad. Because the, I think that they were in the architecture school, but then after some, this experience of using film language, they wanted to be filmmakers instead of being architects. So I, well, we, we have similar experiences and we feel very responsible, honestly, because, you know, students that after five years or six years of studies, they drift completely. I'm, we haven't faced the parents yet, but I'm sure uh, sometimes we'll get letters from the parents saying, OK, we've paid so much money for these studies. <laughs> and then the students end up... Uh, but quite, uh, I mean, we, we, we had ex uh, fantastic students uh, in various universities and they even um, like now are professionals and winning festivals and, and so it's, it's really, really uh, reward, rewarding for us. But um, of course the majority will end up working as, uh, as architects, but what we are, um, let's say what we would aim for ideally is probably to give them some uh, more than tools, probably it's just a, a slight level of awareness of how observation is important in the, in the process of making architecture or, uh, or as, a, as, a, as an approach to, to their discipline, let's say. That's, that was our real interest in what we've done, for instance, at the AA school, is, uh, is uh, rather than looking for making masterpieces, because we were not at all interested in the technical aspect of filmmaking, that was absolutely not the object of the, of the course, but on the contrary, uh, slowing down the pace with which they look at things look uh, really trying to um, develop um, their attention their skills in terms of observation of listening to things and of also understanding how much it brings as an architect to look at how just people behave live uh, what are their real needs in terms of relation to space rather than thinking right away in terms of design and solutions, you know? So that's, that's what, let's say, if, if we have uh, our real intent uh, in teaching is, is this, is really to probably if we can slightly change their attention and, and, and observation skills. Mm -hmm. It's a great question. I mean, w one of the restrictions in a way of, of the laboratory of the future was that um, participants would not be asked to bring huge amounts of stuff to Venice. I mean, it was part of the, the decarbonization agenda. And what I didn't expect was that 
film and installation and video and the moving image would provide such a rich environment or a landscape for, for ideas. So rather than see a film as a substitute, a poor substitute for something where you couldn't bring a model, suddenly these practitioners emerged who were using the moving image, sound, projection, I guess the kind of technical um, aspects of films to say things that had never been said before. And that aspect of it was very um, surprising to me, but also incredibly inspiring, yeah. It, it really felt at the end as if some new medium that sits somewhere between representation, reality, virtual, digital longing was suddenly emerging. Yeah. Or probably not suddenly, actually, it's been there for a long time. But this exhibition gave it a kind of platform, whether it was a one square meter perspex tray or a bay in the Arsenale. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you enormously to the panel. Any last words from? Well, the one thing I would say is that I don't teach filming, <laughs> so I'm not. Uh, it's, but I, as a curator, mm. I choose film. Mm. I've chosen film as a fantastic medium because of all the observational. Mm. Um, the, the way you can observe time, behavior, it's a more anthropological way of um, communicating architecture. Mm. And so that's my uh, I mean, there. It, in, in some ways, I would say that everybody on this panel and including people who will come onto the next panel are in themselves a form of hybrid beast. You know, everybody is an architect plus something. So architect curator or architect filmmaker and so on. And so there is something about this combination or the in-between space that I think is really enriching. And rather than that typical, um, the, the default mode of most architects is to say, well, as an architect, I do X, Y, Z. Actually, I think what everybody here does is to say, the additional um, discipline gives me something more. It, it's not about replacing something else, it's actually about adding to it, which is something that we've been saying all along. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. Thank so you. we're going to take about a five minute break and then the second panel will come up. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. So um, welcome back to the second panel. Um, I'm going to structure it slightly differently in that I have a series of questions that I think I'm just going to open up to anybody. So rather than target an individual member, I'm just going to ask a general question and whoever feels inspired, leap to it. <laughs> so first question I'm going to ask is, is film daunting? And if so, why? Is film daunting? Um, I think it's, it is, it can be a little because you, there's nowhere to hide behind, right? In terms of um, when you're drawing buildings, a representation, you require a certain amount of experience to translate what you see on paper into atmosphere, into um, a tactile um, spaces. And I think in films, you don't really have the freedom of, of fluff, essentially, you know? Because um, it's incredibly important, you know? Um, I think that there's like something that I was reading that was talking about the tactility, the visual tactility, in so much that the film has to engage all of your senses. Well, all of the, like the visual, the, the sound and even you, you feel like you can touch those spaces. And I think that's why, to some people, it, it is daunting. Mm. You, can, you can't hi hide, essentially. I don't know, I, I think making a building is really daunting. Um, I think making films kind of easy in comparison, like 
buildings, they've got to stand up and keep the rain out. They can't fall on someone's head. Anyone can make a film with an iPhone. It's, it might be a terrible film. Um, ter making terrible films is super simple, and everyone does it um, in their daily practice. So I don't know. I, I, I find filmmaking uh, liberating and telling stories in that, in that capacity is anything but daunting um, from my perspective, um, especially when the weight of traditional forms of architecture um, uh, is so heavy and oppressive and both from within the discipline but from also within the legal frameworks and the construction around architecture as a practice. Um, uh, filmmaking is a ray of sunshine, mm. I think, I don't know, yeah. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to add on to that. I think it's a combination of both because for me at least, it was very daunting to create um, a film that represented my identity, that represented this notion of home that was in between multiple spaces, cultures, languages, but then it was also a liberating process and practice. So it was liberating, but it can also be heavy and daunting simultaneously. Uh, and we, we can talk about the way that we perceive this in students, how students uh, address the question as to whether it's daunting. And I think that I would agree that it's much, much more liberating uh, in terms of going not only the construction of the building, but the drawing itself. Uh, the architectural drawing is a language, is a code that needs to be learned it doesn't really come naturally to all students. It's something that uh, needs an abstraction. It's not immediate. Whereas um, we have found that uh, film allows students to actually imagine in a way that it's much more mm -hmm. liberating. They enter and they have a really positive feedback and they then can start generating spatial thoughts that are much freer. Uh, than using the plan, the section. The plan, the sections becomes really limiting. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that it's not as daunting as learning how to draw in plan and section, perhaps. Mm. Uh, I guess to build on that, um, it, it it's kind of depends on your background and where you're coming from, because some, some students come to us, and um, so our students start in masters, so that's uh, 21, 22 typically, and um, you sort of sit back and you go to some of them, wow, I mean, you've got so many skills already. You know, they've obviously been using probably Google SketchUp from the age of five and then, you know, then onwards, like, um, and they're already fluent in um, things like Unreal Engine or um, uh, AI tools, uh, maybe, maybe not AI tools, AR tools. Um, and, and I think um, it, it was touched on before, but I think that um, a lot of, um, uh, how, do, how do I say this? The, the, the next generation or the next generation on from me feel undaunted by film, maybe because it, it's, it's almost second nature to them. And I think it alludes to something you were saying in the last panel, that a, a lot of our students don't necessarily um, maybe recognize these distinctions between um, being an architect and being a filmmaker. That, that, that kind of comes later when they qualify and they go like, oh, do, do I have to get a job now? Do I have to become like something that's sort of pigeonholed? And I think the, um, the most exciting thing is when, um, when students kind of use the tools that they've evolved and try to apply them to their own sort of version of what that means. Mm -hmm. So some, some, some will like build house extensions and make films on the side or some will be visualizers and um, I don't know, play music and you know, so I think there's much more fluidity with um, the students that we're kind of seeing. So I mean, it, it kind of follows on to the second question, which is, which is quite specific, which is that students who wish to explore ideas that haven't yet found an appropriate medium often find film a very powerful tool. And I'm thinking specifically of issues around climate change, migration, diaspora, social justice and identity. And why do you think that is? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the, all, all those topics occur across time and space, right? Like the traditional mediums of an architect, a plan, and a section are relatively static. You know, there's ways to enliven them and inhabit those those, those drawings, but at the same time, they're, they're relatively fixed mediums. 
and they come out of a very different world, right? Like, if you just think about the site plan as an idea, like traditionally, that's the largest medium through which an architect might operate, right? The site plan defines the extent of the problem. Um, and maybe you're dealing with sun paths or immediate adjacencies or the flow of traffic through a site and a landscape or contextual sensibilities, but anything that falls off the drawing, for the most part, has got nothing to do with you. Mm -hmm. um, climate change doesn't occur on a s at the scale of a site plan. It occurs at the scale of the planet. Um, we don't really, in the traditional vocabulary of an, art of an architect, have mediums through which you can engage that kind of complexity. Mm -hmm. Nothing occurs on a single site anymore in a globalized world. To understand a building like this, you need to understand the hole in the ground where the clay to make the bricks came from, the forest that was cut down that, that made the rafters in the ceiling, the upholsterers that, that, that put together the seats and so on. Like it's an extraordinarily complex network diagram that's both based in time mm -hmm. as well as space that is fractured, dispersed and atomized across the planet. So film seems like a medium that can move beyond the existing frame, rectangular frame of, of the drawing and, and can offer a way of rethinking the notion of sight Absolutely. for designers. Mm -hmm. I, th I think the thing, just to jump on your coattails, I think it's also that uh, kind of thing which is like the Cartesian kind of duality, right? That space exists in um, Euclidean geometry, but it also exists as a kind of fodder for experience, right? And, and experience, I think, is the kind of natural bedfellow of time and space, right? place things off felt in certain spaces and essentially those are scenes, right? So architects are, I think Rem Kuhas says this, he says architects are, um, create scenes for people that aren't actors, you know, and that is essentially why if you are in a kind of period of time, in an era where you start to understand that space has all these implications outside of geometry, then film is is not an easy, but um, a natural way to kind of think of how you represent these ideas. I think it also has to do with the uh, with uh, the way that film allows students to think uh, about architecture, not just in terms of space, but in terms of time. And when we discuss uh, ideas with our students, we present what we do in the unit as a different attention to time rather than space, which allows them to have, to employ long-term thinking, for instance, thinking uh, as something that evolves and adapts, uh, uh, but also in terms of weathering. And then there are other dimensions as well that come, and I think we saw it in all the films, the, the, the potential of uh, entering emotion through sound and music the music is really important. It's a dimension that doesn't exist in the way of thinking of the of architecture, again, through the kind of Cartesian system. It, it, there it's absent, whereas the film allows that uh, entering, uh, that dimension. But there's also, it, it connects with writing and uh, being able to express in words, and I think, we saw in the examples that we, we saw from, from the unit this use of voiceover, w which actually, um, it's not just an add-on. Many times the, the writing is what actually makes the film and up makes these spaces appear. And so it's a quite interesting connection between um, how you make films. And usually films start with a screenplay. It's always a, a the writing that creates the first idea of a, of a film traditionally in the... So I think that there is this idea of like making a commentary, like how film brings the, the verbal in a certain way uh, in as well. But, uh, I think that it's, it's just also a simple case of longevity and duration. I mean, Greta Thunberg didn't choose to study architecture to try to, you know, change people's minds. It's... Um, if you're going to start realizing buildings and try to get structures built, this, there's power structures at play, there's just education, and um, I mean, 
I'm in my mid 40s now. I still don't feel like I've really got going, you know, in 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 um, trying to um, in trying to build out my portfolio and and tackle issues of climate change. It's kind of like it's such a big issue, right? I think it's just so much easier to engage with it through that medium. It's like, um, but if you're going to play the long game, mm -hmm. then maybe it's it, it's more effective to do it through architecture. I don't know. I'll tell you when I get to 80. Okay. And um, I want to add that for me, film was so liberating because basically, at least the process of creating Ferenc allowed me to engage in a sort of um, dialectic with the spaces um, and these fragments of space that I was putting together in order to express this um, narrative of my identity that I hadn't seen anywhere else. I just felt this need to represent my own experience, um, to validate it for myself, for anybody else who would I identify with this in-betweenness um, in diaspora. So, yeah, really, really the process of reconstructing different spaces with photogrammetry and then going back and writing about different memories I had in different spaces and then basically reconstructing the narrative of those spaces with the fragments that I did end up finding and putting them all together um, allowed me to come to even new understandings about identity within the process of mm -hmm. making the film. So there's something really interesting here. I think um, Liam's explanation for me um, in, in a way hit the nail on the head, which is to say that the world that we are faced with is all about huge scale. It's about movement, it's about fluidity, about insecurity. I mean, these are the tropes that kind of define what's in front of us. And the conventional tools of architecture came from a world that was the almost the opposite of that. And so suddenly, to make a spatial architectural material economic, whatever, whatever term you, you put on it, representation of this world cannot be made with old tools. But at the same time, it's not that those old tools are not fit for purpose, they, they exist, they, they exist for a reason. So we're in this space of kind of perpetual hybridity, which is not a natural home for architecture, which is, its instinct is actually the opposite. And I just wonder how you see that. Yeah, I mean, I, I um, uh, definitely see the limits of, of traditional architectural practice um, and for a long time have escaped that form of practice and essentially my model of teaching is helping students to escape that form of practice as well. Um, I mean, at, at its core, I think architecture is really the act of making and shaping stories with and about space, right? Um, and in doing that, there's an extraordinary capacity for architects to to play a really critical role in in the way that the world is formed. You know, I always believe that fiction is this amazing shared language, and it's always been the vehicle through which our culture has shared and disseminated ideas. So, in in many ways, as we write stories, we also start to write the world. Mm -hmm. And if architects are interested in making the world um, and intervening in it and affecting it in some form, then storytelling necessarily must become a critical act. Mm -hmm. um, and I, that's not to say that architecture as a traditional discipline disappears, but as we're seeing, it's becoming an increasingly niche craft, for the most part, um, something that is so beholden to the mechanisms of capital, um, a craft which is determined uh, to a large extent by those that have the power and means to afford it. Mm -hmm. um, whereas, crafting and telling stories has the capacity to to reach audiences that, that don't show up to events like this or the Biennale itself um, or to architecture lectures or read architecture books. It can transcend mm -hmm. those disciplinary boundaries and actually engage people in um, really meaningful discourse. And mm -hmm. and if we truly believe, as you, you said in, in your introduction, to, I think to one of my films, that, that climate change and the climate crisis is is no longer a, a function of technology, which is to say that 
for the most part, the solutions to, to dig us out of the holes that we've created for ourselves are already here and have been here for 10 or 15 years. If it is then a crisis of culture and politics, then making work that intervenes in that landscape mm -hmm. is kind of the, the work and the project of our generation. Absolutely, yeah. And I don't think buildings that exist on singular sites with singular footprints has the c sufficient dexterity to, to operate in those radical terms in truly a, a time of crisis. I mean, it's, people are going to howl at this, not necessarily in the audience, but certainly online. But in a way, the the classroom, the architectural school, is is the last radical space left standing because it's the one place in which influence about what comes next is it's felt viscerally. Would you agree with? I mean, you're all teachers at at some level. Yeah, I think I think that's true. Um, but um, I, I'm actually starting this year a new program uh, uh, at the Bartlett called Cinematic and Video Game Architecture, which is looking specifically in that film, uh, the combination of film and architecture, but moving into the uh, video games and also immersive environments. And I would say that in this space, there is a need to critique the technologies themselves that we use to create these visions because they're not neutral and they also carry um, um, ways of seeing voices that are already uh, baked within the technology and it's, uh, I think, uh, a responsibility for us to also uh, critique the methods that deliver this type uh, of visions. Um, Google, um, Apple, the big corporations, and they have uh, profit in uh, the way that they, uh, they they operate as the main focus. And I think that uh, education and environment offers an opportunity to um, uh, spend time and think mm -hmm. about where this is going. Uh, and it's about architecture, but it's also about this new realm that we're entering. Uh, which combines the physical and the and the digital. Mm -hmm. Talking about um, critiquing technologies, um, a lot of Ferenc, I think, is a product of that too, because I remember, um, by the way, I'm, I was a student of Liam's program, um, but I was looking at a lot of the 3D assets that are available in game engines, um, and I was, you know, looking at, oh, are there any from Ethiopia or anything that I could, e that speaks to me to create this world that I'm envisioning from my memories. And when, when I looked up Africa, the only thing that came up was this thing called Slum Pack, which is a, pa a pack of digital assets that are, you know, representing things you see in a slum. And I thought, okay, well, this is not representing you know, I don't, I'm not talking about a slum. I'm talking about my memories. I'm talking about fragments of a city. I'm talking about the butcher, the fruit stand, um, a relative's home. So I think what I was doing was also a form of critiquing what's available. So that's when I, I started reconstructing my own assets mm -hmm. through this crowdsourced process of you know, um, I basically asked people to send me WhatsApp photo, uh, videos and use that for photogrammetry. So they were distorted um, and fragmented because of this nature of them not existing before and me not being able to access them and to travel back and forth to all these places um, in the production of the film. But basically, even from the perspective of a student, um, it was really, um, it was just important to be able to create my own assets and then create this archive, which then turned into a counter archive in youths um, that, that supported the story that I was telling. Mm -hmm. And I think the setting of, of pedagogy, the, the setting of university is the right place to do that because you are somehow shielded from the realities of economics, right? Well, it and depends on the university, but yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, and or, or well, other things, right? There, there are always 
um, architecture is a discipline that's based on restriction and constraints, right? And I think university allows you to to shirk some of them, to swerve some of them, and and in that respect, they become very, very um, kind of ingenious places where we mm. get things that could possibly not exist in the current time that we are, but could in future. Because mm -hmm. I think a lot of students take the opportunity to really look into things that they're interested in. And those things that they're interested in, if they've really done them justice in the setting of a university, they go on to keep doing them after. Um, and what are the developments um, in this pairing of, of architecture and film that we should be looking out for? I mean, you mentioned video gaming and virtual reality as being one kind of thread. What are some of the others? Uh, I mean, I think we're in a really interesting moment in the context of film, gaming, animation, immersive, where those different silos were until like literally three years ago entirely separate mm -hmm. right you you went through a, a program and you graduated and you either worked in the gaming industry or the film industry and you never jumped in back and forth between those two lanes with advances in gpus um and real-time rendering power what is now actually happening is that the same tools the same software workflows for game is actually being used in visual effects in film and TV. So uh, things like virtual production um, is now using the same rendering engines that, that gameplay did. So you're now getting the collapsing of all of those different silos of entertainment into one software workflow. Um, and that represents the possibility of mobility for various creators to move across different, different mediums. Um, it represents the ability to prototype and visualize imaginary worlds at a at a at a pace that's never been possible before. You know, instead of actors performing in front of green screens, they're now performing in front of rich, full rendered environments. Um, so there's an immediacy through which a performer responds to an imaginary context in the way that was only possible with forms of you know, traditional filmmaking on real sets in real locations. So you get this amazing convergence. So, you know, previously in, in the program that I run in Los Angeles, maybe a few, just a few years ago, 70% of the students were in kind of a film and TV workflow. Now it's switched and 70, 80% of them are working in game engines, but still 70 to 70 of them might, might end up in the film industry as opposed to the gaming industry. So that convergence is like literally happening today in this moment. And that must be happening in a place like Los Angeles because of its history and association with film and capital and so on. But what of the, the student who's sitting in, I don't know, Kinshasa, who is seeing a world through this work and using film as an as a tool to explore something that's relative to them that doesn't have the same capital workflows, possibilities around it. What's, what's it doing for, for him or her? I mean, um, maybe a, a bit of a prosaic answer, but um, during lockdown, we found that um, a lot of students were um, using game engines and using mm -hmm. procedural workflows to describe complex assemblies. So, you know, seeing a uh, an assembly that comes together over the course of a minute, it was necessitated by lockdown because it helped them describe kind of how things came together. So actually, I'm not sure it kind of answers your question about mm -hmm. breaking power structures, but it means that um, uh, in terms of communication, they've got these tools to describe things that um, five years ago Didn't they weren't. Exist, yeah. so, mm -hmm. um, so it's definitely changing the way we're seeing um, fabrication like uh, I was, I, I'll use the word drawing they are kind of drawings but they're time based um, and, and, and I guess the potential of that is that you can communicate with fabricators you know competitively across um, different parts of the world or um, yeah and we're talking about filmmaking but um, a lot of the work that the students do because they they're still within the environment of Im uh, of of imagining a, f a future structure uh, and the, the, the world building 
uh, in a way. They're, they're creating the, these uh, imaginary uh, structures. Um, and by bringing the interactive element in and uh, working with game engines uh, breaks that uh, narrative structure and allows a certain level of agency within the way that this narrative can be built. It also allows, when it becomes an immersive experience, to, to become part of that space. Um, and then the design of architecture becomes something that can be broadcast. When we were talking before about the building being something that you can only experience in one location. Uh, if it's a, a, a digitally constructed uh, space that you can still enter, uh, but uh, through this technology, it can be something that can be sent uh, to everyone. Uh, Dependent, depending on the uh, technology apparatus, which probably is becoming smaller and smaller uh, every year. So we will see how that goes. So that there is a kind of potential for uh, communication of ideas that are very spatial in a way that is unprecedented, I think. Mm -hmm. Because when it was always locked into the plan and the section, the audience was not having any access to it. It was now audiences that are not trained in uh, plans and sections can communicate, can, can partake to really complex architectural ideas that have not been built yet. But there's one aspect of this that I've found fascinating over the past, I don't know, maybe two, two, three years, which is that on the African continent, the most widely, for, um, widely used platform is WhatsApp because it compresses data, so it's cheap to send, or it's cheaper to send images. But images are are compressed to the point where they lose a lot of definition. So what I've been seeing emerging in a lot of the young architects that I work with are these slightly blurry representations of digital worlds which has come about as a direct result of the quality of resolution of image making. And that has implications for how you might build because the softness that a lot of these worlds seem to emit can never be replicated in real life. You, you can never have glass and steel meeting in that kind of fuzzy, undefined way. And yet those images are incredibly aspirational. They're, they're beginning to filter into music videos and um, the, the Nollywood, the Nigerian you know, uh, film industry. And so there's this relationship between the technology and the, the capital that underpins technology that allows these images to be disseminated and the ways in which people, I guess, consume those images and then replicate them. So I'm kind of interested to, to, to hear or to discuss whether the liberation or the, the, the kind of liberatory aspect of film also has its caveats. And those caveats are to do with location, to do with capital, to do with power in roughly the same way. I think the technologies, the, these advancements in technology um, have made filmmaking and world building more accessible. Mm -hmm. um, and that's specifically in my context. I was using WhatsApp videos. Um, and I mean, the image quality was reduced, but of course, but I was still able to create these reconstructions and build that into the narrative. And so I think, um, basically that even with game engines, um, the fact that they don't need as much rendering power, you can definitely do more and, there, and you can build your whole virtual set, right? You don't need an expensive camera or a whole crew. So I do think that um, with some of these tools, with game engines specifically, um, filmmaking is more accessible across the continent. But, but there's something particularly in, in your, the, two, the two films that, that you showed, which I think was really interesting, is that both films rely on a certain dissolving quality. Like, this was very strong for me, the idea of images dissolving from one state into another, probably more so in Ferenc than in, than in Planet City. But even in Planet City, there's this sense of something falling all the time that gives the film a certain quality. So in a way, the... What, what might be viewed as limitations of technology 
also give rise to something else, to some other form of expression. And it's that that I'm interested in, like not so much the fact that someone doesn't have access to capital or the resource or X, Y, Z. What does that do to the medium and, and what new emotive qualities emerge as a result of that? And in, in looking in the great endeavor in particular, it's, it's been so strange the whole day that every time I point to somebody, their image is on the screen and it wasn't planned. It's just kind of weird that it happened. But in the great endeavor, what was very, very striking for me was that the image of alternate technologies is not something that happens somewhere else where we never see it. Actually, it's right there, you know, these images of deserts, of turbines, of this kind of dystopian view of alternate technologies. I will never think about wind turbines in the same way again. And that's partly because, <laughs> it's happened again, <laughs> the, the screen, or the, or the film allows us to, s it, it shows us that. So it changes how, how we see it. It changes how we see the world. And if I was to add to that, I, would, I, I think um, there's, there's a sort of, uh, in my mind, a misunderstanding of what a, a green world looks like. It's kind of not necessarily going to be bucolic rolling hills and, you know, um, greenness everywhere. It's going to be electrical infrastructure. It's going to be... Um, big bits of equipment, we need to build like incredible amounts of stuff. And I feel like th these kind of, um, we're still on it. I, I, think, I think this is kind of a, um, an accurate vision of the future, I don't know. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I think what, what we're talking about is, is that like a, an artist's capacity to imagine the unimaginable, right? Or, or to find visual form for that which is um, it kind of sits outside of the popular imagination. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I totally agree with Mike in that the visions we do have of our future, at least a hopeful future, uh, based in the failed environmentalist ideals from the 60s and 70s, right? Like these like small scale urban farms, trees on roofs. When we close our eyes and think about a hopeful future, it's very green. Mm -hmm. It doesn't look like giant planetary networks of carbon removal infrastructure. Mm -hmm. It doesn't look like massive towers of purple LEDs growing um, high density crops. But it's, that is the pragmatic reality. If we are gonna get through this, that is the type of imagery we need to come, become accustomed to. But within popular culture, within the culture of film even, that imagery is typically associated with the dystopian. Yeah. Um, anything that operates at a planetary scale is the work of the Bond villain yes. or the faceless mega corporation, right? Um, so, you know, both of my works, Planet City and The Great Endeavor, and, and are an attempt to create new planetary imaginaries to try and talk about and provoke responses to the fact that, yeah, it, like it, farming isn't going to look like someone getting up with sunrise. Um, going out and feeding the chickens and looking out across the, the, the rolling green hills. It's going to look like people in, in white lab coats in high towers on, on the corner of every, of, of every, of every street. Um, and trying to bring that into the popular imagination is part of the attempt to do it. The visual language that we use in something like The Great Endeavor then co-ops the, the language of the sublime yeah. um, quite deliberately. Because there we had a moment where we're capturing and rendering the natural world, we see it both in its wondrous form, but also somehow slightly scary. Yeah. Um, and that's how I think we start to relate to these technologies. As we, as we look out across the world's largest solar field, it is both awe-inspiring in terms of the, the mobilization of resources that's come together, the, the, the extraordinary ingenuity that's made it happen, the promise that it holds, for, for renewable energy, but at the same time, it's desperately scary because it's not what we've been told that our futures are gonna look like. But, the, but there's a very interesting um, aspect of the sublime here, and I'm just thinking about Ewa's film because watching your film, I kept trying to fill in the backstory. So the film seemed quite benign. It was a street, I happened to know the street, but the juxtaposition of the text and words and the image, there was something 
missing in a way between them. And my imagination had to go into that to, to make sense in a, in, a, in a very literal way of what was happening. So in a way, it was another form of the sublime. It was not the awe-inspiring, fear-inducing, but there is some very human need to try and figure out what, what is happening. And I think film does that in a way that almost no other medium does, it, at least for me. <coughs> There's um, there's no question there, sorry. <laughs> I'm just going to say things. Um, there's this French philosopher called uh, Merleau-Ponty who says, um, le, le film ne se um, pense pas, il se perçoit, which translates into English to mean you don't think the film, you perceive it, you know? And that is essentially, I think, what we're talking about as well when you speak of the collective imaginary. You know, it's this understanding that, yes, there are limitations to the technology, um, but there is this kind of collective understanding that we have of certain imagery, and that allows us to fill in the blanks. In um, Beck Road, it was a very specific um, kind of setting in so much that the kind of stories that they were alluding to are, are things that are known throughout um, kind of hackney and stuff, you know? And I guess in a setting like this, um, some of the blanks aren't immediately filled, you know? But I think I've left enough in there for, for you to kind of, um, mm -hmm. for anybody to kind of uh, make, make a guess. Mm -hmm. And kind of using this idea of this man running at that speed as a kind of, um, is it the, the, white, the dead cat um, strategy where you kind of um, let people focus on that so that they don't see exactly, exactly right. what's happening mm. behind? And, and I think, yeah, I think. But, it, but it's, it's, it's again, it's a, it's kind of a slightly similar point though that what connects all of the films and, 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 and also yesterday, and it's part of the reason why it was this particular selection of films, is that underneath almost every single one is this very human impulse to say something. And whether it takes the form of photogrammetry or text speak or migration or hybrid cultures, the, the impulse to, to say something and, and to, f to find that one is heard is, is really rooted in all of this. And it's, I guess, super complex, interesting, I'm not quite sure what the word is, that 50 years ago one might have written something, you know, a piece of paper, a, 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 a word to evoke that. And now we're sitting with DPUs and rendering machines and WhatsApp and there's a whole different kind of series of tools available to us, but the impulse remains almost exactly the same. Yeah, I think this, uh, now that you say it, I'm thinking of Vitka and Paris, the two students, and they're very personal, both these projects for them. And they struggled actually through the year to find the right way to say what they had to say, or actually the medium helped, her, helped them define mm -hmm. Uh, what they wanted to say, Vitka's her experience as a second generation Indian in London, this idea of hybridity, she was doing a lot of reading, her essay was inspi inspiring the, uh, what she was uh, doing in the film, but Paris as well, uh, and that was a really difficult, because she wanted to say something about the gold mining in Australia, uh, but it was a very sensitive subject matter for her, uh, and she really struggled to find the right balance on mm -hmm. how, to, how to, to approach it and how to express it. But it becomes really personal and it brings all kinds of other dimensions in. For instance, the voiceover in Paris's film is her mother. Her mother is actually voicing it. So, And that was done by asking her mother to read it back in Australia and sending the recording to add to the film last mm -hmm. minute before submitting it. So they become really personal projects that allow them to articulate things that, um, as you were saying, uh, are quite difficult to define outside this medium. 
Uh, sorry, I'm going to be very quick. Um, I think that's the difference between an architectural film and a film about architecture, right? And I think when you're looking at architectural films, it is that urge as an architect to make your mark on the world. You know, so you are trying to say something. You are trying to to make a mark, essentially. And I think that is why I think a lot of these films have been trying to, well, trying to portray a message. There was something that really stuck with me from the first film um, when she said, India is a state of mind. And a line was drawn, I believe, somewhere in London. Um, and that immediately spoke to me because that's what I'm trying to do, what I was trying to do with Farhan as well because there, I wanted to articulate this sense of another space always being present, even if it's not physically there. Um, and with film, with reconstruction of space, I was able to reclaim those spaces and say exactly that. Mm -hmm. So it, it does, visually you can articulate things that, at least for me, I felt like I didn't have a vocabulary to discuss or to even know how to comprehend um, throughout, I don't know, probably up until college where I, when I started reading decolonial theory mm -hmm. up until then, I didn't have a way to, to articulate that. And so it, I think it naturally just started coming out with film and the visual language and the juxtaposition of space and mm -hmm. representations of those spaces. And I think there's, for me, there's something super evocative about this relationship between words and images that film allows us to inhabit it allows us to consume it without without too much effort I want to say so that you know if I look at the image in, in Ferenc of a coffee ceremony dissolving into fragments of time space I'm still not 100% sure it evokes something of the nostalgia in me for being in two places or having two cultures or two languages in one's head, like I can recognize that, even though um, I would be hard pressed to articulate it in, in words. And I think there's a kind of shortcut that film does to us that allows us, a bit like music in a sense, to go directly to emotions that find other forms of expression much more challenging. And I think architecture for so long has been on the side of not being available for those kinds of expressions or experiences. And it's just very interesting to me that film um, has emerged as this, on the one hand, quite technically sophisticated and complex medium, but uh, on the other hand, allows you to say very, very directly, very, very personal things about one's relationship to the world. It's not a question either, sorry. <laughs> I'm gonna ask a question. <laughs> But, but yeah, I mean, and also to go back to your to your to your point about um, resolution, like like, uh, I mean, I, I, yes, I, I do think resolution is becoming a new form of class, and that will become even more prevalent as things leave the screen and become augmented reality, virtual reality, mixed reality, and that, you know, there you have the functions of the screen, bandwidths, refresh rates, and so on, becoming functions of urban space, and and it will create more disjunctions between those that can afford high res and those that you know, are in the kind of low res uh, slums and ghettos, um, like the Future Slums uh, 3D pack. But at the same time, um, you know, almost every phone has a 4K resolution camera on it today. Like, you know, when I'm talking about the convergence of these mediums, I'm also talking about the fact that previously to make imaginary worlds with this with the sort of resolution of of some of the films we're seeing today would have required literally computers the size of this room and now people can do it on laptops they can do it on laptops that are quite accessible that that so many schools have and students can borrow so we, we really are at a moment where certain f forms of of filmmaking have become democratized and particularly the sorts of filmmaking that allows us to create imaginary worlds not just putting a camera up to the world as it exists, have become more accessible. 
um, and so do the tutorials that help people to learn how to use them. So, um, you know, it's still not an even distribution, but I do think there's more access to different types of storytelling than there ever has been before. And if we're not telling stories, then what on earth are we but doing? But that's right? the really interesting bit is that, um, you know, we, we tend to think about um, resolution being the new kind of class factor, the, the, the kind of class division. But one of the things I noticed in the Biennale College that was very, very strong was that students who came from places where they were expected to have less actually had more in the currency of the college, which was to do with resistance, subtlety, tactics, etc. That was their language. So suddenly those students who had access to the technology and the bandwidth and the resolution found that that was of no use in trying to tell a different kind of story. So suddenly the the impulse or, or the platform for telling stories was the, was the divider, not the resolution. And it's that aspect of the democratization of this medium that I think is really interesting, is that it gives rise to other forms of capital that are sometimes to do with imagination and sometimes to do with experience and sometimes to do with history and that have nothing to do with whether you can afford a, a 5K camera or not. And that bit of it, I think, is incredibly exciting and very, it's, for me, it's very visceral and I felt it in this exhibition almost all the time. Yeah, I, I also think it gives rise to other forms of audience mm. as well, right? Like other, other forms of, of being able to disseminate work and ideas. Um, because ultimately, I mean, again, to relate to your question about why we feel the need to say things, like part of that is, is in inherently the idea that someone's gonna be there to listen. And what film has the capacity to do uh, is to connect with people in in the most extraordinary ways because we are all in many forms literate in stories, right? Like ever since we can sit up, mm -hmm. we're put in front of the TV, we fall asleep into the pages of a novel. Like we're literate in stories in a way that then we're not literate in mm -hmm. the traditional mediums of plan and section. Mm -hmm. um, and if as, as architects or designers, we value the ideas that we work with, it is literally our responsibility and our duty to find mediums through which those ideas can get out into the world in front of people that normally wouldn't have the privilege or the language through which to understand them, and film can do that. Yeah, mm. absolutely. Uh, I'm gonna see, any questions from the audience just before I go on? Not yet, okay, so I'm gonna go and ask one of mine. It's, it's often assumed that anyone with an iPhone can now make a movie. True or false? I think you, you partly answered that. But. True, I think probably true, yeah. True, like my daughter, she used the camera but she also filmed things in, on her iPhone. She did a really brilliant little film for... Um, and I, I should say here that I'm using the word iPhone ubiquitously. <laughs> there are other smartphones. <laughs> there, are there, are other, other there are other <laughs> smartphones, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, th I think you can make a film with something even more low-tech, you know, like just a stills camera and piece together um, a, a stock frame film. But I think, I think the, um, a, 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 I guess um, we're, talk we're kind of getting to the, the, uh, the question of like, what's the, what's the purpose of, of these films, or what's the purpose of the education of of, of um, the people who were coming into our studios? And I guess um, audience is really important because I think um, in any kind of activity that involves producing space or producing film, I think you need to have empathy, right? You need to you need to have an understanding that someone's going to watch this, and how how are you trying to uh, connect with them is really important. Uh, and, and I think. Back f like 15 years ago when I started teaching and we were, um, we were in undergrad and doing maybe more traditional kinds of um, uh, architectural educational kind of programs, I think you, it, we all, it was always difficult to kind of embed this idea of empathy into a, a, into a student project. Mm -hmm. like, like how do you, okay, I'm designing a school, but who is it for? I don't know anything about these children or like, you know. And so um, I think there's always this gap in student projects about 
like really engaging with an end user, which actually is, is what your training is kind of for. It's kind of to engage with an audience, to engage with an end user. And I, I feel like film does that more successfully because as soon as you, as soon as you ask, uh, uh, as soon as we ask the students, you know, is this film really connecting with anyone? You, can you imagine watching this and not kind of mm. switching it off? It triggers something. Even that simple question really triggers something. So I guess, um, I guess the question is, can anyone with empathy make a film, I yeah, guess? Rather than anyone with an iPhone, yeah. yeah. Um, but the thing, there is another thing, the following up, following up from this, because um, like where this is going, uh, and I think that we're still talking about these separate categories like film, uh, architecture, um, video games, immersive environments, but I, I'm beginning to see that there is something that is happening that might make a category that might be something in between these things. And um, the idea of the work that we do is that, uh, and we hope that sometimes students might actually create a practice that might sit between these things, mm -hmm. uh, but not necessarily belong to an artistic practice only but might be something that is specific for industry or for hospitals or for uh, a hybrid between physical space and digital space that creates uh, a, a more empathetic and engaged relationship with space. And I think that there is a field that is really uh, open and pregnant with possibilities at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the thing that we are trying to tap into as well. Mm -hmm. It makes me think in a way of, um, you know, when you think about um, lawyers, when you, in training to be a lawyer, you, you know, you're essentially practicing a skill that you've, you've been speaking since the day you were born. Architects have to learn that skill. It's not innate in a way. And depending on what that skill is, it has a huge impact on what's made that the relationship between the way you imagine something and what eventually comes into the world is very rarely discussed. And so these other forms of imagining might also lead to other forms of world building, which I think is what everybody here is, is saying. But the professionalization of architecture makes it very difficult to, to crack open space for that. I mean, if I had a dollar for every time I've heard, where's the architecture in this exhibition, I could have gone home. <laughs> I could have gone home in May. <laughs> but the, the obsession with what is and what isn't architecture, I think in the end is its own demise. And that's partly related to its professionalism. So, so I think the idea of the professionalization of architecture is quite an important one, especially in this exhibition, right? Because I feel, I, kn I know that architecture at its origin is about, is a spatial praxis, right? Making space. And once you start kind of professionalizing it, it's all about the allocation of risk and giving that to the person that's more, um, more equipped to kind of do it. But architecture exists beyond the profession. It's a discipline that is rich, and as we've seen today, incorporates all sorts of output. And I think that this idea that architecture only exists in, as a profession is one that's misguided, and it is also the one that is leading to that kind of ubiquitous kind of complaint, which is, us architects, why are we losing so much power? Why are we losing our place in the world. Mm. Um, someone earlier referred to it as a niche craft, and, and I think that that is right for the profession of architecture. Mm -hmm. But, but at the same time, we're really happy that the Teatro Piccolo doesn't fall down on our head. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so there's, I mean, there's something about that interplay between, I always like to think of it as the interplay between the amateur, who's the person who can afford to lose everything because they do it for the love of it, mm -hmm. and the professional who has to regulate what it is that they do. And rather than see architecture as one or the other, yeah. there's something about that tension, that, which is the same tension that we've been talking about all day, of, of not quite being one thing or the other, and to see that as productive and not, not as a weakness. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. The duality of it is mm. its beauty. Mm. Sorry, Leo. Yeah, but I, I, you know, I mean, again, I've, I've built a career on helping people not be architects. 
Um, so I, I have a very vested interest here, but like I, I do think that like they're just they're just different types of architects, right? And and when when our students leave and go on and 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 work in the entertainment industry, I still think those that have come through and with a background in architecture to a certain extent are still operating as architects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and the fact that they no longer call themselves architects isn't a dissolution of the profession. It's quite the opposite. It's actually a strengthening of the profession because it 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 is about finding new realms where we might have the capacity to have influence. Absolutely, yeah. When, when the traditional forms of our influence has increasingly been shrinking and so little of our world is made in any way, shape or form mm -hmm. with an architect, um, the fact of spreading out and being an architect politician, being an architect who works in uh, an art department in a film studio, being an architect that um, works in a marketing department, or an architect that's a writer or a curator, actually means that we have more scope to affect change, and it should be something that's celebrated. And the great tragedy is that so many architecture schools, obviously with the exceptions of um, some of the studios that are being run by guests on the, on the panels today, are still teaching students this idea that at some point they're gonna graduate, put a PDF portfolio together and send it to Frank Gehry's office and you know start the ladder up the way to become a project mm -hmm. architect. And that is defined as the mainstream of architecture. And the stuff that we do and we've been talking about has historically always been thought of as being on the margins. And again, wh where is the architecture in this show? Like the stuff that we're talking about is now firmly in the middle, mm. right? Like I think the minority of people graduating architecture school go off and, and follow that traditional path now. So actually this is a mainstream architecture biennale. Mm. Um, the next one that, that corrects the course with a bunch of buildings is in fact a fringe architecture mm. biennale, I think, mm. um, in the context of what people mm. are doing today. Yeah, absolutely. So I have a burning thought that's connecting both of these questions. Um, so thinking about anyone who can make a film or having an iPhone, having a smartphone, um, yes, anyone can make a film, but that doesn't mean that they're going to necessarily respect the power that they have in making that film. And so when I think about empathy, um, yes, it's extremely important, but it also makes me think of, in particular, a series of films that were shown in my high school, particularly to construct empathy for the purpose of <coughs> volunteering in African countries and other places in the global south. And that narrative was so powerful. I th and I remember, this is one of those moments that's kind of ingrained in my hippocampus. Um, that everything I do now is kind of in resistance to, but they were creating this narrative of the continent <coughs> as not having anything of value of this place that only has victims or people in need or people who can receive aid, a continent full of receivers. <coughs> um, and that was under the guise of creating empathy. And so I have this kind of resistance to empathy mm -hmm. for that reason, which is not, you know, not totally, um, I know that's not 100%, that was under the guise of empathy, but it's also a powerful. Um, it's a powerful mm. construct. Mm -hmm. It's a construct, Directing. exactly. Yeah. No, it, it, it has, it, it's, a, it's a Janus construct, it has two faces, but I think what's, maybe this is the, the last kind of point in a way to make, but what's really um, fascinating is that probably like you and, and you, architecture was always described to me as something that I had very little to offer, that where my culture had very little to give architecture, that it was somehow def deficit, and that the relationship between architecture and race or architecture and Africa was always that Africa was the receiver, it was never going to be the giver. And what's happened, I think, in the last sort of 10 years is that the, to go back to your point, is that the margin has suddenly become the center. And th those deficits are now the most powerful 
means of, it, of expressing something else. And so it's architecture, to me, the, the conventional discipline that's now in the deficit mode, and that all of this hybridity and fragility and insecurity and fluidity and boundary dissolving and you know all of the things that we're kind of talking about have shown architecture in, in its weak light. And how the discipline responds to that is now, I think, its next step. It can do what it's been doing historically, which is to say, well, we draw up the drawbridge and everything else stays on the outside. Or it can, in some way, take hold of this hybrid discipline and, uh, and, and welcome it into its center and to say that there are things here that are deeply human, deeply political, deeply visionary as a direct result of its medium. So one hopes. I don't see much direction, though, coming from the UK in terms of that kind of leadership, though, professional leadership. Mm. I think they're, they're just too busy arguing with each other about what counts and what doesn't count. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I don't want to be dystopian. <laughs> no, but... I guess, I guess, yeah. the, pro I guess the, the issue with architecture is that it, like, or in, in its traditional guise, is that it's a power construct, right? It's, a, it's about owning the land, owning materials, like it's very expensive to build anything, so it's, it's inaccessible by definition of its own construct. So it's, I, I feel like the, um, from a, uh, going back to the thing about, um, I think universities are a very important place to um, define what kind of this smashing mm. system looks like. But there needs to be a kind of next step of like, how do you really, um, how do you not just talk to yourself? How do mm. universities kind of break out into the profession? And you know, you, hopefully it's kind of going to be just by sheer numbers, but. No, but it's also through media. And I mean, I would say that this is one of the things that's really um, provocative about film. And it goes back to something that everybody has said here, is that the audience it speaks to is way beyond the, the, the kind of tiny clique of professionals who I think we have historically conversed with. And so there is something for me deeply hopeful about this moment, which in part has been generated by a topic, decarbonization, decolonization, that was seen as external to architecture, but in, in a way has become its, its liberation. It's kind of how I see it, I hope. Yeah, I, I buy that. Okay, we buy I, that. I, I, <laughs> the A or B and RBA, just little, they're over there. No, and I mean, it's, it's kind of ironic in a sense to go to, to, to the title of Noemi's film. I mean, this is a lot with, with little, you know, the, the impulse to tell a story is, it's, it doesn't require much. Yeah, it goes back longer than architecture. Yeah. Thank you, thank you everybody, and thank you for staying. Thank you to the audience, and I really, I mean, as we said all along, so many people will watch these um, recordings, and it's been, I think, the, the hallmark of this Biennale that the online life, partly because its audience is also located in places that will never come to, to Venice, has been super important. So, um, yeah, I want to thank everyone. Thank, thank you very much. Thanks, Leslie. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you so much.